Chris, was your uh, change in job title or role uh, in any way related to this uh, a couple weeks ago when that was announced? Yeah, it's a good question. Obviously, you know, from a timing perspective, people are speculating that that was the case, but it really wasn't. It was. Uh, Paul's thoughts on how, how to um, set things up from a smart perspective when you own a couple teams in the same region. And we made the decisions based on that. It wasn't, it had nothing to do with, you know, obviously this situation. I know it's still early, but are there any plans to honor him via patch or <clears throat> Yeah, we're working on uh, a lot of tribute items, uh, certainly a patch, you know, moment of silence, working on a video. Um, People are bringing stuff by the Rip City sign in the Rose Quarter now. I mean, fans are sending in, you know, amazing thoughts and tributes, and we're, you know, organizing and keeping those all together. But certainly um, we're going to want to honor him, you know, appropriately, and there's going to be more than just what we do at opening night. And, you know, those plans are being, you know, developed and put in place, you know, as we speak. Chris, uh, it's always been important to Paul as an advocate for, for small markets. Um, so I wonder if you could speak to that and the importance of that in, in Portland for the Trailblazers. Yeah, I mean, I think it's been written about a lot, and I think uh, I've seen other owners speak about it and their comments about, you know, Paul's passing. And um, he was super passionate about that. Um, he was very passionate about Portland and, you know, having a basketball team here. Um, and, you know, like you said, advocated for, you know, things that small markets need to be able to compete both on the basketball side and on the business side. He was, you know, super outspoken. Um, and I think he, he earned a ton of respect amongst owners, amongst the commissioner, uh, because he, you know, was so knowledgeable about all of those issues. So, yeah, that was definitely, you know, something that he played a big role in at the league level. I know it's a little early, but uh, with Paul's death, can you speak a little more to the future of the Trailblazers and what's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, we're at this point, we're just kind of dealing with the death and, um, you know, we don't have any imminent announcements or anything like that. And, um, you know, at an appropriate time, I'm sure, you know, we'll come and, and talk to everyone about what potentially could happen. But right now, you know, we're just dealing with the, the grief. Can you know, speak there, so like when you address the team, did you get a sense that this could be something to rally around? I hope so. Um, you know, Jay, I, you know, I think... You know, it, there's, a, there's an interesting confluence of events. Um, you know, a lot of the guys really had a relationship with Paul, you know. Um, you know, I think when you saw, I thought, I thought our guys were remarkable yesterday on social media, you know, the way that they honored them and, and you know, kind of relayed personal interactions and personal stories. And, and I think they do, they, they realize they've had a great luxury here. We all have that we are a small market team, but we had a big market owner. And he never, you know, he never treated the guys here, whether it was contractually, in terms of resources, in terms of, you know, how we traveled, the buildings we played in. We were as big a market franchise as anyone in this league because of Paul. And I think the players in this room really respect and, you know, and appreciate that. And I, and I think they do feel like there's every year we find something to rally around. And, you know, it's it's not always an us versus them, you know, mindset. It's really more about us, and and I think, I think guys gave up a long time worrying about anybody else was saying about our team because all we ever do is is overachieve, but but I do think it, it was a very solemn conversation with the guys this morning. Um, they they they've been affected by it, and you could and you can tell that. Like I said, I mean you know you're heading into opening night where there's going to be a void sitting in that front row where the guys are used to seeing Paul. And, you know, and on the road, you know, and, and you know, there were guys that asked me, you know, when he wasn't on the road in the preseason, what was going on and how he was doing, because he had this omnipresence that um, that was clearly missed. So, like I said, our, our guys are going to go do their job. Our mission doesn't change. They're going to compete at the highest level. We're going to overachieve relative to what the prognosticators expect from us, like we always do. And hopefully that does bring some honor to Paul, because you know, he had decisions to make this off season, and he really believed in this group. Yeah, what was it like sitting next to him at games? <laughs> you know, that, that has, it's probably the worst seat in the building, right? <laughs> because what you are is the most overpaid fan for two and a half hours every night. And, and, I was, and it was unique. I mean, I was the only general manager in the league that, that sat there 
and sat next to their owner during games because it's incredibly stressful. And um, but it was a time Paul kind of felt like it was a good time to kind of catch up within the con. But then the emotion of the game takes over. And like I said, you know, Paul was interesting. He wasn't stoic during games. I mean, like, you know, you could have a meeting with him five minutes beforehand where he had an incredible like he worked on a totally higher intellectual plane than the rest of us. And you could have a conversation about a transaction or a trade or the direction of the team or what it was. And the minute he walked out there, you were sitting next to a super fan. And, 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 and he lived and died with every dribble and every outcome. And what was interesting about Joe wasn't just the, the outcome for the team and the game. It was guys he wanted to see well. You know, guys that he had given contracts to or guys that were up for contracts or guys come back from injuries that he really had a personal affinity and connection to these guys because he watched draft film on them. Right. And if we traded, he watched tape and he read the analytics and he read the scouting reports. And, you know, and with that came a responsibility on my end, because since I've been here, there has been one basketball thing we've wanted to do that he hasn't approved. But he wanted to know that we went through the process, you know, properly and, you know, did our due diligence at a level where we were really confident in the decisions we were, and the recommendations we were making to him. But because he was so a part of it, it was a very unique relationship between what was going on on the court. It went beyond, I want my team to win. It really was interesting that he wanted to see guys do well. And it didn't matter if it was a summer league game, a preseason game, or a playoff game. He was rooting for all of them, you know, to accomplish something. I, I, I think it was my second year here. Um, he was looking around for a piece of paper, and he got a piece of paper off the bench, and he started drawing a picture, and he handed it to me. He goes, you should make T-shirts that are like this, and it was a player-focused T-shirt. It was my second, my second year. I was like, it was pretty amazing that your owner, is a, his attention to details is you know, a T-shirt that he wants in the fan shop, and he, he drew it up really nicely and handed it to me. So it ran the gamut of you know, everything when you were sitting next to him. Will his chair be left open? Um, highly likely. And then could you just clarify too, is the team owned by Vulcan or by his estate? Um, I think those details will come out right now. Right now we don't have all of those details. Um, so there'll be more to come on that at, at a later date. Neil, in your last conversation with him, when he was talking about the Minnesota and Clippers game, did he say what? Intrigued him. I mean, why was he watching that one? No, it was, was, you know, I think, you know, and I don't want to speak out of school, but, you know, someone had relayed a story to me that when Paul went through this um, back in the early 80s, I think it was a year, the way it was relayed to me, that the Sonics were on a big run. And, like, he literally would do his chemo around getting to the next game or being able to watch the next game. And it was, obviously, it was, you know, about four years prior to him becoming an owner you know, of the franchise. And I think, you know, it was hard for him. I think his internal calendar just kind of goes off that, hey, it's September and it's October and it's time to get back to camp and basketball. And, you know, it was it was just so good to hear from him that he was, you know, the games were on NBA TV and wherever he was, you know, laying and whatever treatment he was getting, that the, the ability to dissociate from that and focus on basketball and wanting to share that. You know, like I said, if, if he had had a Jimi Hendrix album on, he probably would have called Bono. <laughs> you know, but it just, you know, he, he th this is like I said, it just I, I got the call. and he, I think I had an order of law and order on or something. And it was you watching this Clipper game. And I was like, oh, shit, I, I better put on the Clipper game. You know, they were up by 30 and yeah. nobody cared. And the guys who were in the game probably aren't even in, on the teams today. But it was like it just was in his mind. It was, hey, it's hoop season. We watch hoop. You know what I mean? And. You know, and he wanted to talk about how do they look and how does Minnesota look and what's going on around the league. And I watched practice today and Jake's gotten better and Myers is shooting it. And like and the things that he could extract and he, he viewed things through such a different lens that, you know, it was you always had to kind of be on your game when you had the conversation. You know, it wasn't just a generic check in. It really was, you know, it, you had to, you had to really be dialed. And it's really remarkable because it's hard enough staying locked into all the details of one organization, let alone multiple professional sports franchises and strato launch and hospital clubs and music projects and philanthropy and travel and art and concerts. And I mean, it's just, it, it's incredible. And, you know, like I said, and it was, it, you know, it made me feel good that he didn't call about any specific thing we were doing. 
he just had a really good night and he had a burst of energy and he was feeling positive about where his treatment was going and he wanted to talk hoop and I was, you know, the person he called to share that with. Because of Paul's connections with the city of Seattle, there's a lot of speculation. People think someday Trailblazers could potentially move there. Can you speak to that um, and what that might look for the future of this team? We, all, all we do is live in a world of speculation. Yeah. Like, I mean, <laughs> you know, that just happens to be the area of focus here. But like I said, look, things that we could even unequivocally shut down, we're not going to get into that today. Like I said, we wanted to share this with you guys, talk to you a little bit about about Paul the person and Paul the owner and what he meant to our franchise. And I'm sure, you know, John Schneider and, you know, Pete Carroll and the guys are doing that, you know, up in Seattle as well. And it, it was important that we express that to you guys and make you a part of it because, you know, Paul could be a little enigmatic, you know, with the media. I mean, he was, but he was different with us. And I, and I think it's important that people realize he was different with us and the players and the guys around here maybe than he was with what his public persona was in terms of media perceptions. Neil, how does Paul compare to other owners in the league as far as his relationship to the team? I've, I mean, Chris has worked for multiple owners on other, in other disciplines. I mean, I had one other owner, um, so and I obviously our colleagues with teams. But, you know, I, I think it's different with Paul in that, you remember, Paul bought the team. He was very young. Like, you know, someone, I think, I don't know if it was you, Jason, or not, someone talked about the stories of Kiki and Clyde going up playing horse at the house, you know, and things like that. So I think, you know, Paul Paul's always going to be that 30-year-old guy, you know, 35-year-old guy that bought the team, right, that was still active and athletic, even though, you know, it's one of the things I always talk about when, we, when I stopped coaching was these guys are always going to be 22, and you just keep getting older. But the way you view it doesn't change. You know, the way you talk to players doesn't change, and I think – I think that's really what made Paul unique was he bought it at such a young age. He really had more of an interpersonal relationship with guys, you know, as peers to a certain degree, because on an on an age timeline, they weren't that much different. And like I said, he just he loved players. That's why he loved the draft. Right. It was it was about the future and it was about seeing things other people didn't see. And it was him like raising children wanting to watch the guys like Damian, who you draft out of Weber State, and people are rolling their eyes about why you're taking a four-year guy from there. And he had been at, he had watched tape. He had been at the workout. He had had dinner with them. You know, he really felt invested in him. So to watch this young guy go on this remarkable journey and lead a team to where he's led them and be a first-team All-NBA player from where he was when we were sitting in the gym six years ago, watching him do a draft workout, he really embraced that part of it. And I think that made him incredibly unique personal relationship with players I think sets Paul apart and pure passion for the game I mean just loves basketball everything about it and the amount of games he went to is different than the other owners that I've worked for um, it, was, it, it was certainly really real um, yeah, it seems like he had in particular a connection to this core group I remember the <coughs> talk of the after the Gold State Series when he gave a really interesting yeah. speech can you maybe uh, reflect on what that speech was like and, and what his emotions were and his connections. Yeah, it, you know, like I said, Paul doesn't address the team, you know, as a whole, you know, very often, you know, usually maybe early in the season, you know, at camp, um, and then always after our last game, you know, Paul will address them and, you know, commend them and let them know what the directions are, you know, going forward. And, you know, that was a unique situation, Jace. You know, we... Um, we were in a situation where we obviously had turned the roster over and the direction of that team in terms of what the perception was going to be in terms of the timeline was so different than what it became. And I think it really was symbolic of turning around a small market. I mean, at the time we became kind of the benchmark for how quickly that you didn't have to rebuild through a dumpster fire. Right, that you could, you know, populate your roster with young, talented players with upside, and you know, and make judicious trades and be opportunistic in free agency and still be successful. And I think I think he took a lot of pride in that because a lot of planning went into those decisions for that team, right? And it and emotionally it was tough for him. You know, when Lamarcus left, it set us on a completely different timeline. And I don't think Paul didn't know how quickly we were going to get back to what his level of expectation is. Remember, we're, we're talking about a guy that. 
made the playoffs, what, 23 out of 30 years? I, I think I read today that, you know, with his passing, he's the all-time leading owner in terms of wins and winning percentage. Like, you know, a lot of that goes, because of 1977, a lot of that is forgotten. But when you look at success in terms of, you know, we have high character guys, you know, they, they're, they're great ambassadors to the organization, we win. I mean, we would be the model of a lot of small markets. So I think Paul took a lot of pride in the fact that our, that year we had the lowest payroll in the league. We signed unsung players. You know, we, we had had kind of a different draft because we made a trade on draft night. And, you know, we were kind of playing this money ball type approach and watching the expertise of Terry and the coaches and the leadership of Dame and the growth of guys like C.J. McCollum and the impact of Mason Plumley and Mo Harkless and guys like Farouk and Ed Davis coming in who had been on minimum contracts the year before. I think he was so proud of the fact that knowing that's really hard to do. And it's really hard for an owner who had had so much success to buy into operating like a small market owner. Because like I said, we're a small market team. We had a big market owner. And Paul's operating thesis had always been he was Paul Allen, right? He was, he was you know, the most successful owner in terms of financial resources in the NBA. And that was what gave us our edge. So to do it another way and still win 44 games and advance to the second round and be in a dogfight with perhaps the most talented roster ever put together. I think he was just really proud. It was like watching your kids, like I said, you know, the analogy I said to you is watching your kids kind of overachieve at something. You know, watch them accomplish something you didn't believe they were maybe intellectually or physically or emotionally capable of accomplishing. And he shared in that, probably more, Jason, than any other season I'd been with him during. I think he had, I think he enjoyed other seasons, but I think that one was really special that it started off with one operating thesis and became something totally different. You know, and you got to remember, like, you know, there was a little bit of a kind of a sibling rivalry, too, that, you know, it became we beat the Clippers with Steve Ballmer, you know, to advance. And they have three first team all NBA players on their roster. And you know what I mean? And to get into Golden State and, you know, which is Silicon Valley's darlings, you know, and like what he meant to Silicon. I mean, he basically created Silicon Valley with Bill <laughs> Gates. So there was so many other, you know, storylines that all came. And, you know, and, and like I said, it was it was really inspiring watching how he connected with that group of guys and how how empowered they felt watching how emotional he got that night in talking to them. Draft night was always his thing. He so much knowledge for the owner. What was it like to you being in that room? I mean, I know he had his favorites, but ultimately, you know, you're going to make the call. We did, you know, but it, <laughs> it, it was it was interesting. You know, you'd get to the point where you know, you'd send, we'd send off, we loaded up all the film, the same edits we were watching. You know, they were loaded onto the Vulcan server, and it would be the strangest time. You know, like the Cannes Film Festival, and, you know, and <laughs> you've got, you know, half of Hollywood on the boat and Paul's watching tape on a guy we like in the second round. <laughs> so, you know, so like I said, once, you know, Paul always ended up deferring to the expertise of, you know, myself and Joe and Billy and Rosie and, you know, the guys that made the decisions. But you better be on your game. Like when he brought up a question about, hey, I'm seeing this on the film or what do the analytics say? Or I read this scouting report or the intel or the psych or I mean, like, you know, I remember I was with the Clippers and Mike Dunleavy and I and Gary Sachs were kind of like, yep, these are our guys. Mr. Sterling never looked at a draft book, couldn't re couldn't care less. And I got up here and, you know, we had four picks my first year. And I'm getting emails from Paul at three in the morning, like our time going, well, I'm watching this and his handle. I'm a little bit worried about this. And, you know, we need a point guard. And um, you know, I really like his shot blocking. And so, you know, and but it was really interesting because he did put the work in. You know, this wasn't the arbitrary. I saw a ranking on ESPN.com or I watched a highlight film on, you know, some website. I mean, he was he liked he enjoyed the process of it, which was which is really interesting to Paul. I mean, we use that as a buzzword, right? It becomes buzzword bingo. We're all talking about process now. And at the end of the day, we're all judged by results. But Paul enjoyed the path to the draft, right? He wanted to know what was going on. He was one of the guys, I think, he probably was the first guy to actually watch the combine on ESPN because he wanted to know who everybody was and he wanted to put a face with the name. And um, so, like I said, it was interesting and watching the personalities on my staff interact with Paul after a draft workout in our, you know, in our bunker back there, you know, was really interesting because as, as you asked and like Chris said, 
you know, I have guys in my staff that have been in the league 30 years, so they come from different ownership psyches, and Paul's really unique with this. You know, there are some owners that might show up on draft night, might not. You know, you let them know what you're going to do, and Paul really wanted to watch the cake be baked. Hey, Chris, obviously you have a, you know, a different perspective because you're involved with some of his ventures in Seattle. Can you speak to his passions of music and you know, some of the non-sports things? Yeah, I mean, art. He's just a huge fan of all, all types of art and wanted to create. I mean, he loves the cities that he's in, Portland and Seattle, and he, he wanted to create things that, you know, could last in a city forever, whether it was a museum, you know, an art fair, music fest. I mean, he really it was him wanting to develop something to give to the city so they could have it because he just enjoyed it so much. So everything came from that perspective. It also came from a... You know, if I can spark creativity in kids, um, that happened to me at an early age. And he really tried to develop things where, um, you know, a, a kid could go learn, you know, how to write a song or, you know, how to mix music or, you know, how to, how to work computers at an early age. He was really always about, you know, sparking that kind of passion in, in young people, um, which the stuff I worked in in Seattle was my favorite part was a lot about that. He even, you know, wanted it in our arena. He said to me one one game, we don't have a good kids area in our arena. I want you to develop a kids zone. So that's why the kids zone is on the 300 level that we have now. Um, so he's like, yeah, go do it. Um, tell me what it'll take. And we need a place for young people while they're at games to go and interact above and beyond the game. So a lot of it came from that perspective. Neil, did you feel like working for Paul made you a better executive just because of the kind of his his interest and his his want to, to push things? It did. You know one from one you can't rest on your laurels. You know, Paul drove every day. You know, because the, the one thing about our calendar with the NBA anymore, there is no break. There might be ten days in August, right? So it didn't matter, that, you know, whether it was summer league, you know, he wanted to know we were competing there and free agency where he would participate in recruiting meetings. And so your owner is sitting there. You can't just say, you know, we went in and met with the guy and, you know, he wanted to know how things went at Gerg's camp in August and when the guys came back in September. So what it really made me do is you had to stay on top of what was going on in the organization 365 days a year because when it came to the Blazers, he wanted to know that the stewardship that was in place was handling it the way he would handle it if he had time to dedicate it to it full time. And that was what was remarkable is he really trusted the people that worked for him, but he expected them to work with the same passion and diligence in all areas, in all sports. You know, John Schneider and I talk about this all the time, you know, up in Seattle. And I mean, that's it. it he didn't take any of his entities for granted, whether it was music, art, football, basketball, soccer, it didn't matter. So it really did keep you on your toes. You didn't get to kind of just take the path of least resistance when it came to building the roster. And, you know, I mean, there's a guy, you know, he would talk as much about late second round picks or the 15th roster spot or, you know, Terry, you know, joked with me, you know, what it would take for me to actually come into the season with only 14 guys on the roster because Paul always felt there's got to be some one more guy. The money doesn't matter. There's got to be one more guy that you need. Like there's got to be somebody out there that can help us if we need you know, if three guys get hurt, isn't there somebody like and and bring them through? And we did the two way contracts. And, you know, I mean, he really wanted to make sure no stone was unturned when it came to building the roster. And, um, you know, when you've got someone driving you like that every day in the beginning, you're 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 more reactive to them. And then what happens is just through osmosis, it takes over where you're trying to stay ahead of him and anticipate what he's going to come up with next so that you're prepared with the answer to build confidence on his end, knowing, and that's why your point about you know the draft is watching how it was handled and presenting to him and making sure the draft or free agency, he believed in the decisions and recommendations we were making because he saw the due diligence behind the scenes, that he didn't feel like he had to step in and fill that void. Neil, what your interview with him was on his yacht in Italy, no, I wish. <laughs> no, he was in uh, his home in London. Yeah. <laughs> it was in his home in London. Uh, yeah. You had to know right then that, hey, this is a different owner. I, I did. You know, I, um, you know, it was interesting. I, you know, showed up at his home and it was an interesting interview because 
you know, I didn't do the Kinko special with my binders and books. And I walked in in a suit and, and my feeling was, you know, I have a great job where I am. We're winning. You know, I'm in no rush to leave. So this is really going to come down to the connection we have. And I think what Paul had been through in previous years, I think that was really his priority as well. Was it someone he was going to be able to communicate with and, you know, and bond with and share a common vision? So, but yeah, you, you talk about being on top of it. He broke out the media guide, the Clipper media guide, and went through every transaction that I had been a part of for nine years. <laughs> like down to, well, and this what you traded this guy and what made you, you know, we went through every single one. And a lot of it was... Wanting to see, even I think if I remembered what you know the, the, the you know the, uh, the transaction, but a lot of it was really just the attention to detail and knowing that is important to him. And when you work with him, it's not just the macro vision and the big decisions; it's every decision. And no matter you know, no matter how insignificant it may seem, there's a process behind. It. And you want to know somebody that had the energy level, right, and the discipline and the motivation to take as much into consideration in those transactions as he was going to. Um, you know, I, like I said, it, it, you know, the stories that I got from my predecessors about what would go into, you know, the preparation. So I had the luxury, you know, look, Kevin Pritchard and I are good friends and I thought he did an incredible job when he was here. So I had a cheat sheet on, hey, you're going into the draft with four picks and you have nine days, Neil, you better, like, if you want to be able to take the guy you want, then this is the things you're going to have to show him you went through to build his confidence, right? So, um, so yeah, the, inter the interview was interesting. And, um, and then I remember, you know, I, we took about a week, and Paul was in Africa, and then I had gotten the offer from the Clippers, you know, to stay. And we Skyped. My wife was ready to divorce me, but we Skyped for 43 out of the next 48 hours <laughs> from Africa. Because he just wanted to make sure he got the decision right, because he didn't want to live through another, you know, making a quick, you know, a quick move. And it literally took until the Monday before we were hopping on a plane to go to the combine, because he just wanted to make sure he got it right. So, you know, the fact that he went through all of that for this one organization to make sure that the person he was entrusting, and I'm sure Chris has stories on it as well, but. You know, it was it was that important to him to make sure he put the right person in his mind in place that he could work with because the Trailblazers meant so much to him. I, I know there are things you can't talk about today, guys, but the season is starting. There's players being waived. There's things going on in the season. Are you comfortable you're going to be able to operate, Neil, uh, without any kind of freeze on by, by this corporation? Or are you going to have your hands tied? Or are you free to make whatever deals that you could make or moves you could make? No, look, I mean, right now, I mean, none of us want to be trite and use the word business as usual. But, you know, everybody, everybody knows what Paul's goals and what his, his hopes for this roster were. And, you know, if there's ways that we can down the road, you know, bolster the roster and further, you know, our chances of winning at a higher level, that'll, it'll all get taken care of. Uh, like I said before, we're not going to get into specifics, but there isn't a person that worked for the tra any of Paul's entities that don't understand what each of them meant to him. And I think that's what we're all dealing with today, Dwight, is knowing it's our responsibility to further that mission and the people that are involved in decisions at every level of Paul's organizations are working off that same premise. What would you say to fans who are concerned about will the Blazers be as competitive, will they definitely be staying here when they haven't had to worry about that for 30 years with Paul Allen? No, and, and they've been blessed. And you know, one of the things I think I've talked about in the past is I don't know that everyone realizes how lucky they are in Portland to have had an owner like Paul Allen. Um, you know, you look at some markets that weren't able to make it and you look at, you know, how sustainable it's been here and the resources we've had. and. You know, I think Dwight talked about it yesterday. We were talking about moving from VCM or VMC to um, over to, the, to build what's now the Moda Center and the Rose Quarter and, you know, with no public funding, you know, because he believed that he believed in this team and this market and felt like we could win here. And, um, you know, like I said, he became an incredible advocate for small markets, whether it was from a, you know, a business <laughs> revenue standpoint or from a competitive balance standpoint. So, like I said, you know, that, that was important to Paul. And, it, and it's important to Paul's memory going forward. 
And we have a large market fan base too. I mean, they support our, I mean, our crowds and our fan support and the brand is uh, incredible. And it's, it's been incredible every year we've been here, even when we had, you know, a down year at the end of it. Was it our first year? First we, year, we were yeah. and we, we finished 0 and 10 or something like that, and it sold. We sold out every night. So, you know, our fan support has been absolutely incredible, and um, it put Portland on the on the map from a sports marketing perspective. I mean, it's it's amazing the the support we get from them.